This is a city of music. From Handel to Hendrix, from punk rock to the proms, London is alive with musical legends. But where did the music come from and where is it performed? Today, London's venues are famous around the world. You can catch a classical concert at the Albert Hall, get down at a gig at Wembley Arena, and see a huge range of musical acts at any number of venues in between. Whatever you want, you'll find it here. But until the end of the 17th century, there weren't really any dedicated music venues in the city. The main place to hear music would have been in churches. This is the crypt of St Mary Le Beau in the city of London. It's an arched crypt, and in fact, it's the oldest arched crypt found in any church in London. It dates back to the 11th century. It was in surroundings like this that medieval Londoners listened to music. Although, of course, in those days, the music was designed to glorify God and not to entertain the audience. Plain song is the earliest known music of the Christian church. It was usually chanted one note at a time, perhaps because the huge echoing walls of the church might have made any more complicated arrangements more cacophonous than solemn and godly. The chants of priests and monks would have been a common sound emanating from London's churches and abbeys. However, as plain song was sung mostly in Latin, it's unlikely that much meaning ever got through to the common folk of the city. Secular music was considered ungodly by stricter clerics. This kind of singing was thought to incite lustful behaviour, especially when combined with dance. There is no doubt that music outside the church, focusing on love, political satire, dance and drama, were popular, but it wasn't until 1672 that London's first documented public concert took place at Whitefriars Music School near Fleet Street. After that, the idea of going somewhere just to hear music really began to catch on. Back then, a musical performance was a very different affair from what we might expect today, as were some of the instruments they used. I'm in the museum of the Royal College of Music, and I'm with Jenny Nex, and you're curator of instruments. That's right. That means you say you know all about these weird things you've got here. I know something about some of them. We have about 800 objects in the collections. So wow. Lot of things to know about. Uh, hang on a sec. Is that an instrument or, or a mistake? <laughs> this example here is a serpent. Now, you can tell from the shape, perhaps, why it's <laughs> Yes. Dating back to the 16th century, the serpent was originally used to accompany chanting monks. Later, it was used in military bands for a part that is nowadays played by the tuba. Well... I think maybe I need a little practice. I think so. It's a very difficult instrument to play. Ah. Um, Handel wasn't very keen on it. He said, um, this certainly isn't the serpent that seduced Eve. <laughs> so no, I think I'd believe it. So when did music really take off in this country? In London, um, the first concerts, as you know, were towards the end of the 17th century. And throughout the 18th century, the popularity and the number of things you could do in London gradually increased till right. the end of the century, the 1780s and 90s, when there was a huge amount going on. So what's all this stuff? Well, you can see here we have a picture of what went on at Bagnig Wells, which was a pleasure garden in Islington. Everyone's dressed up to go out. They the really evening. are. Amazing. I mean, even the blokes have wonderful hats and the women, well, it's way over the top. Gosh. Other things that went on were the things like the concert series. This is a ticket from the Concert of Ancient Music. Uh, you can see this one, 1795. Um, the Ancient Music concerts were celebrating music that was older than 20 years. <laughs> so um, most of us Not are a bit terrible. over the hill. <laughs> yeah, yes. And we have also the programme book from 1795, the word book, uh, where you get lists of the different concerts. You can see there that it's mostly Handel oh, yes. for this one. And then you get all the words that are going to be sung by the singers. So you could sing along? You probably wouldn't sing along. You might talk through it all. I think right. concerts weren't the, the quiet occasions that we expect of people today. And then the sheet music. That meant that people could read music, of course, which was quite yes. complicated. Indeed. Well, in the domestic spheres, the young ladies would very much be playing the keyboard instruments, things like the harpsichord and the piano. Ah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is a harpsichord. And there is a young lady poised. Bridget, what can you play for us? 
I can play um, an arrangement of one of Handel's arias called Lascio Chiopianga from his opera Ronaldo. And this was arranged and actually published in the 18th century in a collection called The Ladies' Entertainment or The Ladies' Banquet, oh. designed for ladies to play at home. Good, but I'm allowed to listen, am I? As a non lady. Absolutely. Okay, take it away. <laughs> Gradually, more and more people wanted to buy their own instruments, and more and more manufacturers set up shop in the city. If you couldn't find space for a harpsichord in your parlour, there were plenty of central London shops where you could find something a little smaller. A gentleman, like myself, might have gone for the slightly less cumbersome violin, an instrument which, unlike many, hasn't changed in design over the last 300 years. One person who really knows about violins is Mark Robinson. Mark, what's this instrument? This is a Stradivari from 1691, uh, worth in the region of um, $3 million. $3 million? Yes. Wow, wow. Do, they don't get more expensive than that, do they? They do indeed, yes. Um, a really, really perfect example of a Stradivari will be a lot more money than that. Why are they so expensive? What's so special about them? Um, really, it's the tradition. The fact is that they've been around for a long, long time. Um, I mean, 300 years, uh, it's, a, it's a long proving ground. So they, they've actually lasted the course. Um, they sound fantastic. They have wonderful varnish, wonderful ground. Um, and really, you can see the genius behind the making. Mark works for Beers, a company that started selling violins in Wardour Street back in 1865. Demand grew and founder John Beer decided to employ craftsmen to work in his own workshop. Most of the early instrument makers in London, like Beers, would have been based in the Soho area, as that's where the publishers and the theatres were, so it was a hub for musicians. Of course, now it's possible to mass-produce violins cheaply in factories, but for the right sound, Mark insists that traditional crafting by hand is the only way. A month of hard work goes into every violin. So I wonder how far I'll get today. So if I work for a month or two, will I wind up with a Strad? You might end up with a violin. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much indeed. You're very well. Cheers. <laughs> London's instrument makers were keen to demonstrate their craftsmanship. In 1901, piano makers Beckstein built a lavish auditorium next door to their workshop in Wigmore Street to showcase their wares. Wigmore Hall is still used today, and you can see that the stage appears to represent a rather charming parlour, so that you could imagine the same musical scene taking place in your very own home. But for some productions, you need a venue on a slightly grander scale. The Royal Opera House first opened in 1732 and the first opera by Handel was performed here in 1735. Unfortunately, it burnt down a couple of times, but this wonderful auditorium has survived for more than 100 years. It holds 2,200 people in wonderful red plush comfort. But what really stuns me is the backstage area. The whole lot was rebuilt in 1999, and it's huge. You can just see the stage itself goes back about 15 yards that way, and it's about 15 yards square, something like that. But behind it, there's acres and acres of space with more and more sets. It took me about 10 minutes to walk through them. It is truly fantastic. The Royal Opera House is big enough to look after all aspects of any production. Within the building, there are rehearsal rooms and prop workshops, and they can even make and dye their own costumes. The huge space backstage can easily accommodate scenery construction, but if anything else is needed, delivery lorries can literally be driven into their very own lift and taken straight up to the scene dock.
I'm now behind the main stage at the Royal Opera House, and I'm with Jeff Wheel, who is technical director, is that right? That's correct. So you know how all the scenery moves about? Yes, most of it, yes. OK, so what... Oh, we're moving. That's right. What, what's happening? Uh, what we're doing is the compensator. It's a big scissor lift. It's dropping down a foot. Oh, it's only a foot? Only a foot. So I don't need to be scared of heights? No, 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 no. no. What will happen now is we have um, two wagons of scenery over there, so that's 32 tonnes of scenery. That's a lot of scenery. There. That's right. That's a whole set, in fact. That's a whole set, indeed. Right. And that can now move on, can that's it? Right, that's right. What will happen is there's some electric motors on the sides here. Right. They will uh, rip the wagon and drive it into the gap that we've created. The stages work a bit like a sliding block puzzle. You can move a block into any of the spaces so long as one is always left empty. This new system means that the Royal Opera House can, incredibly, make up to eight full set changes a day, making it the busiest opera house in the world. From the 18th century onwards, London had become a real haven for music lovers, with all sorts of public concerts and operas in many venues, like this one, all the way around the West End. But this sort of entertainment was really only for the upper classes of society. In the 1830s, a new type of musical culture began to emerge from London's saloon bars. It was a mixture of sing-alongs, comic songs, and snippets of opera and folk music. Very soon, purpose-built venues known as music halls began to open, offering entertainment aimed directly at the working classes. You might find it hard to believe, but behind these peeling doors lies what was once called the handsomest room in town, which was in fact a pub with a music room at the back. But in the 1850s, a chap called John Wilton bought the adjoining properties and turned it into a huge venue, Wilton's Music Hall. And it is, in fact, the oldest surviving music hall in London. The interior is wonderful, but there are major structural problems, starting with the damp. In fact, it's the only place in England on the world list of endangered buildings. Wilton started as a music hall in 1859 and flourished for decades until there was a terrible fire, and after that it was used as a mission and a rag store. But now they're using it again and hoping to restore it. In the early days, they used to perform extracts from classical operas. In fact, the performers at the Royal Opera House, the moment the performance was ended, would leap into taxis and come down here, still in their costumes and makeup, and perform the same things on the stage here which the elite thought was wonderful because it would educate the lower classes in the performing arts. I wonder what's on tonight? For real performances, they would have used much bigger hydraulic-powered barrel organs, which were, I guess, the Victorian equivalent of the mobile disco. Let me show you how it works. When I turn the handle, this barrel rotates. That's why it's called a barrel organ. And in the barrel, you'll see there are a whole lot of pins and staples. And as the barrel goes round, these pins and staples lift the little keys here, one by one. You can see them going up and then dropping again. This is, in fact, an early form of programming because there are eight different tunes on this barrel, and all you have to do is move it along a bit and you get a different tune. It's very cunning. Now, when you turn the barrel and the keys go up and down, what they do is to move these levers here. And you'll see that they're going up and down as they're pushed by the keys. And what they do in turn is round here to move these bits of wood in and out and they allow air to come out past the reeds from the bellows and make a noise. So if I give it a bit more welly to get the bellows going... Ain't that blooming marvellous? Despite attempts to educate those who came to the music halls with highbrow musical performance, what the lower classes really wanted was a good old-fashioned knees-up. It's rumoured that the very first British performance of the Can-Can took place at Wilton's before being promptly banned. 
London's music scene was booming, but surprisingly, many of the buildings that were planned for musical performance had been built without any knowledge of the science of acoustics. The very first concert hall in London to be designed with acoustics in mind was the Royal Festival Hall, built on the South Bank in 1951 for the Festival of Britain. Here inside the auditorium, it is quite amazingly quiet. You could hear a pin drop, which is extraordinary because Waterloo Station is only a couple of hundred yards away. There's a busy road next door, there's the river with people walking along it, and there are people in the building chatting, having coffee and so on. And the way they've done that is very clever. Have a look at this. Here outside the auditorium, I can still faintly hear the noisy world, the rumbling of the trains, rattling of cars, hooting of boats on the river. But mainly what I've got here is the buzz of people, people enjoying themselves, shopping, drinking coffee, chatting and so on. And the cunning thing is, even that has been cut out of the auditorium by building the auditorium in a separate box. Look, this is the outside wall, this is the underneath of the floor. So what they've done is to make the auditorium quiet by building a box within a box. The concert hall sits right in the middle of the building, insulated from outside noise by specially designed sound absorbent foyers, a series of double walls and the double doors of the auditorium itself. Another problem they had to cope with was reverberation. <laughs> Just listen to that note. It goes on and on and on. And that's a bit like notes echoing off the walls of a room. I'm sure you've been in one of those cafes where all the surfaces are very hard and there's so much noise you can't hear yourself think, let alone speak. Well, what you need to do is to dampen out some of that echoing, some of that reverberation. Let me show you. This Perspex box is a model of my sitting room. And when I drop a drop of water into it, it's like a note going off in the middle of the room. And the water is there to show you how the sound waves work. When a sound is produced in a room, it decays gradually as it's absorbed by the walls and the air. In larger reflective chambers like cathedrals or concert halls, the reverberation time, or the time it takes for the reflected sound to return to the listener, is longer. The mix of the original sound and its delayed echoes bouncing from the walls can be confusing for both the performer and the listener. When they built the festival hall, they attacked the problem scientifically and they followed a formula worked out by a chap called Wallace Sabine in the late 1800s and he calculated the effect on the notes of the size of the room and the furnishings and what people were wearing and how many people were there and all that sort of stuff and they used that to try and make this room sound natural so that if you clapped you just get a little bit of echo. You see it doesn't go on and on but you definitely hear it. It worked well, too well in fact. The internal walls absorbed the sound completely and there was no reverberation at all. Performers couldn't hear their colleagues on the other side of the stage and concertgoers complained it was like listening to music through the wrong end of a telescope. The good news is that the hall's acoustics have recently been revamped. A clever new system allows fittings and panels in the hall to control the degree of reflection or absorption of sound so the hall itself can now be changed to suit any style of music or performance. Nowadays, if you can't get to a venue to hear the live performance of a song, you can easily buy it on CD instead. But at one time, the only record of a song would be the sheet music itself. Towards the end of the 19th century, sheet music sellers began to collect here in Denmark Street because it was on the edge of Soho, which meant the rents were cheap and it was a short walk to most of the theatres. Well, so many musicians gathered here that the shops began to sell instruments as well and provide recording space, studios. So it became known as London's Tin Pan Alley and it was the heart and soul of the music industry. I'm now inside Regent Sounds with one of the pioneers of rock and roll, Marty Wilde. Mark, Marty, you were a great hero of mine. Teenager in Love came out when I was 16 and I was all a quiver, you know. Oh. <laughs> Tell me, why is Denmark Street so important? Well, for the last, uh, I would say, the last 40 or 50 years, probably more, 
um, almost every song that you've ever heard uh, or, uh, and the public have listened to uh, uh, really originated here somewhere or other. Um, because even if it wasn't written in this uh, vicinity um, of this street, then it, it was published in this street. It was a, it was a bit like Carnaby Street. It was a street that was inspirational, it was a buzz place, particularly for me because uh, nearby, uh, just down the road, uh, there was all the guitar shops, you could go and see new guitars, new amplification, uh, but then of course on top of that, Denmark Street itself was the home of the, of the publishers, and that's where you, 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 know, you, you, you went to get your material, or you went to meet them to befriend them, so they would send you a good song. Ah, uh, I see. I mean, this was a, a recording studio, did you ever record anything here? I did, uh, probably round about where we are sitting now. Did lots of artists come here? Yeah, all the many people, many, many big names recorded here. Um, as I say, I think Tom Jones as well. Tom, Tom did some early demo really? work here, yeah, I'm sure he did. It's not exactly a big studio, is it? No. no <laughs> about no, five not. yards square. No. It's a bit like the Sun recording studios in Memphis, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of those places that, that, that it sort of, and it, has, it still has a, a phenomenal personality. It still has, you can feel it, you know, feel it after all these years. Denmark Street's legacy is huge. The Rolling Stones recorded their first LP here. Elton John wrote Your Song here, and it's where the Sex Pistols laid down their first demos. London's rock heritage takes in some world-famous venues too, like the Marquee Club, where The Who and The Stones played some of their early gigs, the Roundhouse, where the British psychedelic scene was born, and the 100 Club, which began as a trad jazz venue and then went on to champion punk and new wave. This is London's latest music venue, the much maligned Millennium Dome, now rebranded the O2 Arena. With 23,000 seats, it's the biggest in London. And just looking at that and the recent upsurge in ticket sales for concerts just shows that music is alive and well in this great and vibrant city. I wonder who's playing tonight?